it's like that, but, um, but yeah, so we've been doing in-person meetings, but masked right now. So even group meetings now we've, we've kind of returned to that. So how about you all? Yeah. Uh, it's been, um, the, the lab spaces were tougher to regulate because you have, you know, a density of people. And so I think that was, um, Oh gosh, I would say six months to a year that we were doing kind of a team based team A and team B because mm -hmm. the lab is there's too many people in my lab. And so they both in terms of exposure. So if one person exposed, you know, group, you wouldn't lose the whole lab kind of a thing, plus just the density. So we had like, you know, one team doing early morning to early afternoon and the other team doing early afternoon to mm -hmm. evening. And that was hard, especially people with young kids. It was really, really mm -hmm. a tough, tough year for that. Yeah. But, but then they, they eased that restriction. And then I think we'd say in the last few weeks, we've sort of started doing masks are not required, kind of based on what the state, the state of Maryland doesn't require masks. So, yeah. 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 It's been, I, I, uh, you know, I don't know. It's been a mixed bag in Oklahoma in terms of the response, but then um, I feel like at work, it's been nice that we weren't working from home as much just to, we still, you know, still felt like we were. Yeah. Uh, I've actually been to several maybe. conferences, including just this past weekend. Yeah. And uh, I would say, you know, it's a mix of um, people are pretty good about masking, but I think people are also really sick of masking and mm -hmm. it's so hard at a conference to recognize it anybody when everybody's got half their face yeah so just yeah just that social struggle as well has been yeah been yeah but it was nice we had adaa a few weeks ago and it was the first one i felt yeah i was at, i was at adaa oh yeah. were you i didn't yeah. i don't think i actually got to talk to you um but yeah it, it was the first one that felt just more relaxed and people actually kind of not as worried or anxious. It's interesting i've been to i would say five or six conferences just in the last two months uh they're really like some conferences and nobody's wearing a mask and other conferences, everybody it's, it's, I don't know. I don't know what the, the difference is or why, but it's interesting. Yep. Well, it looks like we have a pretty good crowd that has collected. Um, so I will go ahead with introductions just so I don't take too much of your time. Um, but I did, I did want to um, thank you again for coming. And as I told you about maybe not everyone else was on here. Um, you know, we, in, we invited Dr. Bale to come back in May 2020, and we were hoping to push it until we could do in person, but we finally just kind of were, were doing virtual. So, um, but we're really thankful uh, that um, Dr. Bale has taken her time out of her really busy schedule to be able to be with us virtually. Um, I decided to invite Dr. Bale for this lecture series um, after seeing one of her talks at ACNP. And um, which was, I think, focused on the biological impact of um, stress related to racism. And um, the panel was amazing. Um, and uh, her talk was incredibly clear um, in terms of discussing really complicated um, work. So um, basic epigenetic research um, and the translation from animal to human work. Um, but I was also, um, other than the content of her presentation, I was also uh, really um, inspired by just the, the confidence and, like I said, the clarity in which Dr. Bell um, uh, uh, gave her talk. Um, and I think as a woman in science, it was very inspiring to kind of just uh, see that and try to emulate it. Um, and I've also come to appreciate how much she's been a strong advocate um, within at and but also other organizations and just in general for increasing diversity and representation in science. Um, in providing mentorship. And if you do Google her name, I thought it was interesting that a video will pop up um, in which it's talking about diversity in science and talking about um, actually having confidence in speaking. I wasn't, I wasn't sure show. where you were going with that video. Yeah. Pops up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I, anyway, it was great that it kind of um, dovetailed with kind of the one of the, um, one of the motivations uh, that kind of led to me uh, bringing her in to talk. So I encourage you guys to check out, check that video because I thought it, it was really helpful. Um, but as for the more official introduction, so uh, Dr. Bell completed her PhD at the University of Washington in the Department of Pharmacology and her postdoctoral work at the Salk Institute. 
Um, she was professor of neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania for 15 years, where she co-directed the Penn Center for the Study of Sex and Gender and Behavioral Health, and was the director of research for a program called Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health. Um, she's currently professor of pharmacology and director of the Center for Epigenetic Research in Child Health and Brain Development in the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, however, I think she has a uh, upcoming move that, um, that she might share with us. Um, and then um, just as a summary, her research focuses on understanding the role of stress dysregulation and neurodevelopment and neuropsychiatric diseases um, and sex differences that underlie disease vulnerability. Um, and she does a lot of, kind of translational work between mouse models and then also human work. Um, and in true translational fashion, um, one thing, another kind of inspiring aspect of her work is the focus on engaging the community, um, developing collaborations and partnerships with local organizations, health officials, social workers, and policymakers. Um, she's been the recipient of numerous awards. Um, this includes Richard Weitzman Memorial Award from the Endocrine Society and the Medtronic Award from the Society for Women's Health Research and the Daniel F. Brown Award from ACNP. Um, and her work is incredibly impactful. Um, continuously supported by NIH for, I think, over 15 years, if I'm doing the math correctly, um, over 14,000 citations, over 250 invited talks, numerous committees, panels, scientific advisory boards, editorial boards, et cetera. She's currently the president of the International Brain Research Organization um, and was awarded the top 100 women in Maryland in 2020. So I know I took a lot of time for introductions, but I felt that... Um, you're I setting needed. the bar. Really I know, <laughs> I know, but I needed to give sufficient attention to really the incredible impact of Dr. Bell's career thus far. Very, um, very, very, very sweet. Really appreciative of you being here. I'll pass yeah, the. And I, and I do, I do wish that this would have been in person because none of us needs another Zoom meeting for sure. <laughs> it's, it's so much less exciting and dynamic than when you're in person and can share ideas and and, and conversations. So with that, thank you so much for the invitation and. Um, and to try and to promote more conversation and less talking to a black box for this talk, I really want to encourage you, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt, especially if it's something that I didn't make clear, because I would rather stop and, and talk about something than to lose half the audience because I, I skipped over something. So please do not hesitate. I welcome it very much. Um, because Robin was doing his beautiful introduction of the, especially the the part that I am incredibly passionate about living in Baltimore, which is a majority black city that has suffered generations of trauma, violence, discrimination, and all kinds of distrust issues with the biomedical and medical fields that um, as part of the center, as the, the recruitment from Penn, when I moved here from Philly down to Baltimore, was the incredible opportunity that presented itself to start the center, to make the center actually engaged in a productive and hopeful way with uh, neighborhoods and communities in Baltimore. To talk about all of the research that we do, which many of us are very passionate about our research, but I think we don't often get the opportunity to engage in the communities that we portend to be studying or trying to benefit. And I think that's a real drawback of a lot of, of clinical research uh, or basic research even that we don't really get the opportunities to discuss it in the community. So that we step out of our ivory towers a bit and um, communicate with the public. And I, I think that, you know, looking at the past five, six, seven, eight years of breakdown in across the US with communication and trust of science. That's, you know, this is a huge piece of it that we have an obligation to be out there. Anyway, so I do want to just quickly advertise uh, something before I start my talk. I don't know if you can see, can you see the summit thing here? So this is just a postcard that, that I made, actually my, my admin made. Um, so I'm hosting the, the center, I am moving to Denver. And that's, I'll talk about that later, but before I leave town, uh, my center is hosting this giant summit in Baltimore, June 15th and 16th at the Baltimore Convention Center. So I don't care what happens with COVID. There will be so much room for everybody to spread out. I will not cancel this. It's been in the kind of in the waiting for years for us to do this. So a big piece of understanding stress and trauma as it impacts the brain and risk and resilience 
is a, is a really big opportunity here to engage in the Baltimore community with community leaders around this area of trauma. Baltimore is the first city in the country to pass a Trauma-Informed Care Act, and that is now integrated across the city. And so city, I work a lot with city council um, and how they think about policy development, as well as the mayor's office and the health department. I've learned a lot and it's been really informative for research, but I think engaging them with what research and how we look at these, these outcomes has helped them in policy as well. So it's been great. Many of my colleagues around the country will ask me, how did you do that? How did you get connected with them? And so this is really an opportunity over this two days. Day one will be community-based discussion. So it's community leaders. So it's the Baltimore Health Department and leadership in that and the mayor, mayor's office around child and family health, trauma, city council, um, school of social work on many different campuses, including Morgan and Coppin and the university and Hopkins. Um, so a huge swath of people who deal at all levels in the community with the impact of trauma, largely around the child and the child's brain, but not exclusively. So day one will be the community leadership, everything from the mayor, city council, the health commissioner, et cetera, who work in these different areas across the city and around, around three different areas, the panels will cover. So the, the effect of trauma on the child's brain around learning uh, not just in the school system, but kind of wider than that. The second will be specifically on vulnerable periods of development, including and especially pregnancy, because it affects mom and baby, so it's an intergenerational. And that's something that Baltimore has an incredible strength in, is re reductions in morbidity and mortality in that window. And then the third panel will be kind of a broader perspective on the impact of trauma in the community, especially on mental health and addiction and recovery, et cetera. There will be a, the difference of this kind of a summit, I think, is that within every panel will be science. And so there'll be a scientist who will give the biological perspective on each of these areas for, and then there'll be a panel discussion really with some takeaway um, actionable items. So there'll be science and policy kind of coming together. That's day one. Day two is a, a more, um, predictive sort of science symposium. So around similar sorts of areas, but people attending and presenting from the Grady trauma, Milwaukee, uh, Detroit trauma, New York, California, like all the different centers that focus so much on the impact of trauma um, on everything from brain development to mental health and addiction. So uh, it is free, but because of, of, of limitations on size and trying to keep everything as spacious as possible, we're, as possible, we're going to limit attendance. So if you are interested, I will send you what you need for registration. Just send me an email and I'll forward it on to our admin and, um, and we can do that. So anyway, I wanted to advertise that if anyone is interested, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay, let's talk about science. So as um, again, Robin, thank you so much again for that, that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk about some biology as it relates to stress and trauma that I hope um, is as viewed, especially for this audience in a very translational lens. We use mice in my lab. We're very interested in stress. We call it stress because mice are not cognitive enough to experience trauma. We, we can't really define that because we can't have a conversation with a mouse, obviously. So they can experience stress. The circuitry in a mouse is identical to that in a human. And so the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the autonomic functioning, all the same, all the same genes. And so that's nice in terms of you can chronically stress a mouse and then ask about behavioral, physiological, and uh, molecular changes, very similar to a way that you would be able to ask in, a, in an individual who's at risk in a human. And so one of the biomarkers that we're really trying to focus in on, because this field really, really lacks relevant biomarkers, are extracellular vesicles. And I'll come back to that in a minute as to what they are. I like to use this slide from the CDC, even though it's old and uh, I haven't seen an updated graph, but I think it, it's pretty overwhelming already to look at the change by December of 2020 for across the United States for the massive increases in anxiety and depressive disorders related to the pandemic. Um, it, it coincided with a lot of other stresses going on in the country at the time, no doubt an intersection of, of stress and trauma, but a lot of unpredictability, which is a huge stressor, of course, 
And then you map on top of that, the social isolation that happened and those at great risk, especially I think for our young trainees um, and people at home without a lot of social support. Um, and we're gonna see the consequences I'm sure of it for years to come. And I think along that line is also thinking about the, the most vulnerable, whether it be our, um, uh, you know, in black communities, lack of resources, discrimination compounding some of these effects, but also just looking at sex and gender, um, especially for, again, our young families where you're trying to hold down a job, especially our academic colleagues who, especially for women, we saw that the productivity was really cut down by having young children at home and trying to get them on Zoom and figuring out their schooling, et cetera. I, I like to highlight this because I think it's gonna be really important for senior faculty and people in leadership positions to take the lead on how this effect is gonna impact those going up for review and tenure for years to come. Because this has been years in the making of really cutting down productivity. We've seen huge reductions across the board for grant submissions and funding, paper submissions. And so, you know, I think we can't ignore this. It's gonna be impactful and it's hugely stressful. Hugely, hugely stressful. So leading into that stress, I like to think about not just the risk, but also the resilience, because it's two sides of the same coin. And we learn just as much by studying those who are the most resilient, not just the genes, but the social support and other aspects that fundamentally underlie how someone might present with a disorder and how another individual, even very genetically related, might be more resilient. I think this tree analogy is great to think about the wind that does not break a tree that bends, which is a, is a well-known African proverb. And if you see the tree above ground, you may have no idea what's going on below the surface and the intricate root system. Clearly in this example, you have an amazing root system with a lot of depth to it. If we use that analogy to think about family structure, people are spread out across, across the country, especially in academia where you may have moved away from your family and social support. And how are you now coping with all of the, the stresses that you're attending to? Um, I was recently as president of EBRO, as Robin introduced, uh, I was in a, a Society of Neurosciences Africa meeting in Ghana, and someone reminded me of the fact that there's also another African saying, but be humble because even a large tree can be taken down by a very small ax. And I think that's important as well, that maybe you are resilient and maybe you're doing okay, which is good for you and you're very lucky, but that doesn't mean that colleagues around you aren't struggling and that um, being aware of what other people may be coping with is, is I think a super important part of being uh, an academic and supporting each other and what, what's going on. Okay, so the biggest factor that um, has developed in my lab's research, because we very much do translational research, we do a lot in the mouse and in cell culture, everything that we learn, every single animal project in my lab has a similar human part of it that we collaborate a lot with around the country. Um, and so the, the, the three pieces of this that I think are the foundation to our research are the G by E by D. Okay, so who is at risk? Who might be resilient? Is really a combination, and this is true for animal models as well, but much more complex to design, which is your genetic background that you inherit. And there is nothing you can do about that. You get your genes from mom and dad, the GWAS will tell you, you are more at risk for some things. Maybe you're at risk for obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Maybe there's no mental health disorders in your family. Maybe there's a lot of cancer. You cannot outrun your DNA. However, the risk is increased or the resilience is built in depending on your environment. And your environment is also very complex because it is the experiences that you have which may be totally out of your control because they could be the experiences you had in utero can shape very much the direction of your brain development, early postnatal life, going through puberty and adolescence, early adulthood, and across the lifespan, really, you continue to experience the environment and respond to it. And we know from the human literature as well that adversity is compounding over time. And so right there, the G by E is so important for things you can't outrun, but maybe shifting your environment. If you are in a really stressful and non-supportive environment, you have a choice maybe that you can make to figure out ways to, to move into a less stressful environment, et cetera. Others in the community may not have those choices. And I think that's also important to acknowledge. The D is the developmental windows. And so that is the when. So it's not just the what, but the when. 
And so mom and dad experienced extreme adversity. Perhaps they were part of the Holocaust. Perhaps they were part of discrimination and trauma that occurred in the neighborhoods that they lived in, et cetera. No doubt, we have incredible evidence now that the germ cells can come together with unique signals. They aren't gonna say, yes, you're gonna you know, present with schizophrenia. I'm, I don't buy into that at all. But what they may do is that when sperm and egg come together, it's just enough of a shift in those signals to speed up the rates of development or slow it down. And maybe they speed it up in terms of implantation rates. And therefore you miss out on key windows of where those, those neurons are pruned. And so they're speeding it up. And now you've missed out on when extracellular matrix is forming around parts of your brain, really ex excluding innervation that needs to happen in that time window, right? So you can imagine thinking about that, the butterflies fluttering its wings sort of analogy here that doesn't take a lot early on to make a shift, to have a profound effect that you may be completely unaware of because it happened even in the preconception environment, right? So the D part of this is just as important. Okay, so that's the, the genes by the environment, by developmental windows, all very important. No doubt if you work in, in, in a clinical setting or in human research, it makes sense, I think, to most people in that sphere. It's much harder in the basic science world because that's a lot to try and understand and model. And so therefore we tend to, to put our blinders on a little too much and focus on just one of these aspects. And it's unlikely that we're really gonna resolve a lot about risk and resilience if we don't start thinking in terms of more complex models. So also to add in here, which is really important is sex is a biological variable. So anybody who gets any NIH funding, you know by now that you have to consider sex as a biological variable. It's a scorable facet of all grants, but it really factors into all of these points. Your genes on the X and Y chromosome are actually really important at the point of conception. They determine a lot about transcriptional changes, modifications in response to environment, et cetera. So, in terms of the G, the sex chromosomes are really important, and a lot has been identified in the past five to 10 years in that. The environment, of course, we experience the environment, whether it's your perceptions of the environment, whether it's their hormonal milieu of the environment, et cetera. Sex is a biological variable, very important there. And of course, the maturation rates of development are going to be very different. And again, just subtle enough, maybe early on, and how we think about boys and girls in terms of those maturation rates whether that be in gestation or puberty can make a big difference for how different parts of the brain are shaped. So all of these factors together are things that we think about in the lab. Um, and really, I wanna acknowledge the fact that for the most part, we're using mice and rats or whatever your, your animal species are. And because of, of course, course of rules on, on wanting a healthy environment for our animals, we're really looking at an uh, uh, and really ultimate sort of outcomes for these animals, right? We're raising mice and rats in these beautifully clean, pristine cages in which they're exposed to almost nothing if your vivarium is doing a good job. Very healthy food, really high fiber, very low fat, et cetera. So think about that. Like, what is that in terms of modeling those at the greatest risk? We're really taking that complexity out of the system when we're asking about different genes or environments. So I think that's important to acknowledge and something we need to address. Okay, so thinking back to before you ever get a brain, before you ever need to think about what's going on in terms of function of the brain, we all started before we were a brain as a sperm and an egg coming together. And my lab, despite the fact that I'm a neuroscientist, I've, I've done a lot in the last 15 plus years learning about reproductive processes because no sperm or egg comes together completely clean and naive of the environment, right? They're all coming with different signals based on not just mom and dad's genes, but signals about the environment, and that's important. So this is kind of the take home message if you walk away with anything is that before this baby's brain, you're born into the world at which you are, are tempted because of evolutionary mechanisms to be best fit for the anticipated environment you're born, being born into, whether that's a famine state, a war, other types of trauma or stress, gun violence, whatever has been experienced by your mom and your dad, whatever that best fit for the brain might be, it is the culmination of all of these things that I've mentioned. Again, so sperm and egg, mom's uterus, you'd be really surprised as we have been in the last five years in our studies to find that mom's adversity that she experiences determines a lot about the functioning of her uterus and the intersection when that embryo implants, 
the crosstalk between the trophectoderm that gives rise to a placenta, as shown on here, and its interaction with maternal decidua. Really surprising differences just at that level there, which again may be evolutionarily advantageous on a big scale, but may be detrimental on an individual scale. So all of these things very, very important. Okay. So what are these, bio, these biomarkers that we're interested in called extracellular vesicles? For those who don't study them, they are super interesting. They have really come in the last, I would say, 10 years uh, as an emergence of um, a biomarker, a potential biomarker from many different fields. As is almost always the case, the most work mechanistically been done here in cancer biology the cancer biologists are always way ahead of the game and identifying these things. And then the neuroscientists kind of sneak in and, and steal all the excitement. Um, so I would say back in the 60s through the 80s, you can see on the, the graph at the bottom there, a lot was being learned about these detection of extracellular vesicles. They are nanoparticles. They travel in very high concentrations in the circulation of all mammals, mice, rats, humans, all of them. And they're secreted by basically all tissues. And so think of it as sort of a, uh, similar to like an endocrine signal being secreted in one site and acting in others with much, much greater specificity. So the type of vesicle, there are many types. You've maybe heard of what people could define as exosomes. Exosomes are the smallest type of extracellular vesicle of these nanoparticles. On the left there, you can see just an example. They're, they're a, a lipid membrane nanoparticle. And in the lipid membrane is full of proteins, even more than you would expect for like a, a typical cell. So really lots and lots of protein jammed in there. And that protein tells you a lot about both the tissue it is being secreted from, as well as the specificity of the tissue it is likely traveling to. So imagine a really clustered, if you've ever been to Los Angeles or New York, where you have like this emergence of all these different freeways intersecting. That's sort of what's going on with vesicles being secreted. They're very dynamic in nature. They get taken up by these other tissues into cells because of the content, both the protein and then the small non-coding RNA content. In this example here, you're seeing a lot of microRNA. And so what happens is if you needed a cross, and I'll give you an example later of the placenta. Okay, so Yoel Sadovsky at the McGee has done a ton of work on this area. But if you think about the different cell types, so for those who don't know, the placenta has, is differentiated by about mid-gestation into all these different cell types that are required for function, both in communication for maternal health, but a lot in development of the fetus, right? All of the nutrients, oxygen, everything growth factors that the developing fetal, fetus needs until it can make it on its own is getting it from the placenta. Okay, so all of those different cell types in the placenta, including the, the inclusion of maternal uh, decidual cells need to communicate. Well, how do they do that? One of the ways that this happens in a rapid fashion are by secretion of these different types of vesicles. And so if something is going on and one cell type needs to, to be quickly recognized by the other cell types to coordinate the response, transcriptional changes can take too long. Secretion of EVs is a rapid way to quickly get in. The microRNAs can immediately alter the translation of a lot of those mRNAs that have already been transcribed, right? So this is just one function that can happen in a very dynamic and rapid manner. So this is happening all over the body. The lifespan time at which the concentration of EVs is super high, the highest across the lifespan is pregnancy because the placenta is making so many of these EVs. So really, really recent data that I don't have a lot of time to talk about today, unfortunately, really suggests that even at the level of communication about mom's glucose levels. So if you start to get to a pre-diabetic state, you're going to shift that signal, altering the uptake of glucose within a reason, right? But you get to a point of, of di gestational diabetes, and now it's overrun and the, and the EVs don't have that function anymore. So it really is serving as both a biomarker Right? So can you imagine if over the lifespan, we could look at EVs from human populations and be able to say, wow, you are looking like you're really at risk here of diabetic state or hypertension, or because they're secreted by the brain as well, what if we could identify who is at risk for a neuropsychiatric disease or, or better yet, what neuropsychiatric disease? And maybe that would help us tailor treatments even better. So again, all different types of EVs going from the smallest of exosomes to really large ones uh, like microvesicles 
what their function is, is something that's, it, it is a really day by day change in this field. Cancer has utilized them actually in a way of both biomarkers for tumor progression and change, but also in drug delivery. So you can make synthetic EVs and load them up with proteins of choice very easily and content to, to target them. So really interesting, very important. I'm gonna skip over this. This is a review that Neil Epperson and I did years ago, but just thinking again about who is the most vulnerable and the timing across the lifespan of that vulnerability. And again, what the function of EVs could be. Okay. I'm gonna tell you two quick stories. Um, and I want to one highlight in the human population because this is the best example I think out there right now was a study that we did in collaboration with the Grady Trauma Project. Tanya Jovanovich and her team at the Grady Trauma. Tanya has recently moved to Wayne State in Detroit and starting a Detroit Trauma Project, very similar to Grady. Grady Trauma Project, for those in the know, Carrie Ressler, when he was a resident in psychiatry at Emory, started the Trauma Project and has really continued on, and I think is the best example by far across the country of ways to engage with the community, to incorporate what the trauma that you're seeing presentation in the hospital, in the ER especially, and ways to study by taking everything from physiological measures and surveys to actual uh, tissues such as liquid biopsies. We wanted to understand EVs and whether or not they could provide the evidence for us that in a mixed population, remember I said, EVs are secreted by every tissue in the body. So how on earth are we gonna get at this question of specificity to learn something from that, right? In culture, cell culture, you have a pure population of EVs that you can study and we do that as well. In mice, we can actually segregate certain populations of tissues in ways that you just can't do in a human. So we wanted to know using an omics approach if we specified a particular type of trauma that we could identify to a developmental window, could we decades later assay by an omics approach changes in EV content that a way would inform us? Okay, that was our goal. I'm not gonna get into a lot of this data because it's all published, but what we did was to look through the Grady database for a huge number of women. These are uh, predominantly black women in Atlanta who are participation in the Grady Trauma Project. We asked about, so they have an overall high level of overall trauma. We wanted to ask about one specific type of interpersonal violence of sexual trauma, because then we could identify the window in which it occurred and ask about that specificity. Okay, so these are women who experienced sexual trauma either up until the age of 13, during adolescence, clear adolescence of 14 to 17, or as adult or no sexual trauma at all. So four groups of women. All of these women at the time of their recruitment and assay, again, all at the same period of time, are in their late 30s and early 40s. So for the most part, it is decades after when the sexual trauma happened. So Tanya's group had already run through all of the physiological stress parameters I'm gonna tell you about. And then we took the blood samples that they had stored. They shipped them to us. We had no idea which ones belonged to which group. We isolated extracellular vesicles from all of their blood plasma. We sent them off completely unbiased to our proteomics mass spec facility. And we looked at the outcome and that's what I'm gonna share the data with you. Okay, but why? What can we get out of an EV besides that protein content? There are other features you can learn a lot from. Here are two. You can look at the overall characteristics of the extracellular vesicles by nanocyte technology. This uses Brownian motion. We have uh, what's called a Zeta view in my lab, and this is like the very high end nanocyte. One thing it can tell you is the overall variation in the vesicle size. Remember I told you, you can have really, really small exosomes or you can have really big microvesicles and things in between. Okay, why does the vesicle size matter? Well, because it, it can tell you a lot about the endocytic rate, the rate at which they're taken up. So the smaller the vesicles are, the more likely they are taken up into cell and to tissues. And that EV type can also tell you something about because they are packaged differently by different cell structures. So on the bottom there, you'll see that the data is divided by those four groups of women. No interpersonal violence or no sexual trauma. Again, in the three ages at which sexual trauma occurred. And you can see the variance within each group. There is about 20 to 25 women. And you can see significant difference in that there's a reduction in overall size. So going more toward an exosome-like type of extracellular vesicle in circulation, right? So remember, this is a mixed population of EVs compared to the control non-IPV group, right? And then on the right, we can also look at what's called the zeta potential. 
that is the overall average charge of the vesicles traveling in circulation. The charge matters. It's called the slipping plane. What that basically means, if you don't remember back to your physics classes, maybe from undergrad, is that the slipping plane tells you about how, how things interact with each other based on the charge. And it tells you a lot about the types of proteins and the size coming together to give off a certain charge. The more negative that zeta potential, the more stable and the change in the adsorption rate as well. And as you can see in that same group of adolescent sexually stressed or traumatized women, that they have a reduced or a more neutral. So what this data tells us just from this initial examination is that yes, one particular developmental window of exposure, women in their adolescence, and you can see that the data trending in that younger group as well, and we'll come back to that, but statistical significance for adolescence toward a more exosome or smaller extracellular vesicle and a more neutral one, meaning it is less stable in circulation, meaning it has to be very fast acting because it's going to be degraded very quickly. The more neutral an EV is, the more likely they are to aggregate and be degraded. Okay, so that's two interesting characteristics that we can follow up on using synthetic EVs as well as our cell culture models. But what about the proteins? So in this study, we sent off all of our samples in a completely unbiased approach to ask about the protein content. So again, reminding you on the left, there's tons and tons of proteins in all extracellular vesicles. On the top in the E there, you can see that we're going from a highly expressed, highly, highly expressed proteins in these EVs in blue, all the way to a very, very lowly or absent in the pink and red. And the non-sexual trauma group averaged across the top, and then all sexual trauma experience groups compared on the bottom. And then we pull out those three groups, those three age groups, even further down below. And so what you'll notice is that across all sexual trauma groups, there's a high number of proteins that are present, or uh, sorry, so that are absent, that are, are, are lower absence, that are very high in the non-sexual group. So that tells us something. And I blew out some of those in F there. That's really interesting because what those were, were annexins and galactin proteins. And annexin and galactin proteins are key features of how extracellular vesicles and most tissues are packaged and secreted. So that's telling us already that there's something unique in some tissues, we don't know which ones, and I'll get to that in a minute, that may be altered about how EVs are being secreted. So again, yes, we've hit upon a particular type of stress or trauma that seems to have programmed a unique cellular function. Okay, now the where and the what. So we went back to looking at our heat map here. And if you look at the adolescent group, you'll see these this group on the far right of really highly abundant proteins in blue that are highly expressed, in fact, only detected in this group and really no, no other group. So what are those proteins? Well, we were initially very surprised to find out that they were all keratin, keratin associated like proteins. So for anybody who does mass spec, the first thing that you do when you hear keratins is you say, ah, this is all contamination and you completely dismiss all of this data. And that is exactly what we did. And in fact, it was after our mass spec facility ran a whole analysis for us that they came back and showed us this data and said, well, wait a minute, it is only in the one group that you're seeing all of these keratins. So we took a second look. And what also came out of this of incredible interest with all of these proteins was that looking at the genes that these proteins come from, the majority of the proteins that were only detected in one of our groups come from this 17Q21 gene cluster. And for anybody who works in epigenetics, that is interesting because when you burn the member of a gene cluster, it tells you something that perhaps during a unique time window and or a unique experience or exposure, some epigenetic modification occurred because it's regulating all of this cluster of genes in the same way. One of the reviewers of this paper actually aptly pointed out for us also present, present in the same gene cluster identified by GWAS for PTSD risk was the corticotropin releasing factor receptor one and MAPT. So in this cluster, from an unbiased approach, set off this unique interest in a gene cluster and a bunch of genes I had never thought about before. But it makes sense. So if you look over on the far left, when I was a postdoc, I had started doing some things around this uh, stress axis because I worked with Wiley Vale. And thinking about, first of all, your stress, your, your skin 
is your biggest stress, your biggest environmental barrier tissue, right? It protects your entire body. We often dismiss it and don't think about it, but you know what? It is highly autonomically innervated. So it's silly that we don't think about it. And in fact, when you do a lot of things like fear conditioning and, and, and skin conductance, you're in fact using the skin as part of your measure. It's also very interesting if you focus in there, I spent a lot of time on this back when I was a postdoc, that the, the components of the HPA stress axis in the brain and periphery are the same features in the skin. Around the hair follicle, you have CRF that's produced, you have CRF receptors, and there is very similar functioning around that same HPA, but really localized to the skin. So when I really started thinking about this, and in terms of, of the grant that Tanya and I wrote together, it's like, okay, it's not terribly surprising. What can we learn now about this cluster? And what can we begin to ask going back to our human population and then designing mechanistic, mechanistic studies in mice? Okay, started thinking more about the skin, the timing. Is there anything there that highlights for us anything about adolescence? Right about this time is when a lot of information was coming out about this, this sensory cell called the Merkel cell. Anybody who knows anything about the recent um, Nobel Prizes, that will sound very familiar to you because the Merkel cell is the only neuronal-like skin cell. Merkel cells are part of these touch dome sensory sensitivity um, receptors in the cells in the skin. They are derived out of keratinocytes. So you can see that they're right up along the touch dome there at the skin. When activated with certain light touch responses, which I think is super interesting when thinking about sexual trauma itself and how we think about someone getting under your skin and the analogies that we use about the skin, that when these cells are activated, they release norepinephrine to the beta adrenergic 2 receptor on a beta sensory fiber. So there's something really interesting here as we started thinking about this. So these mechanosensory skin cells, which a lot, again, a lot of our genes that we identified in this, in this um, omics approach, are part of this Merkel cell differentiation. Again, they respond, and they're not everywhere in your skin. They're specifically in your fingertips, paste, uh, parts of your ears and your face, parts of your um, and your feet. And so they're really in unique places that respond to light touch. The piezo-2 ion channel was recently identified in the last five years as the transducer. This all gave rise to the Nobel Prize to um, Artem Patapudian. Uh, for all of his amazing work in this area. Like I said, it's the only neuronal like skin cell, but here's the piece that really caught my attention when I was researching what these cells are, is that their final differentiation and maturational stage occurs in adolescence. And so does this all start to come together and thinking about this 17Q plus gene cluster and maturation of these cells, have we identified some aspect of a particular type of trauma that gets wired in, that may be telling us something about risk or presentation later on, especially related to adolescent experience. And so that's something we're following up on. So the timing sensitivity, so this is the piece of the physiology I wanna highlight is what we got out of this omics approach, completely coming into it with uh, no bias, which was on the left here, all of these assessments of these group of women, what you'll know when we looked at things that are giving rise to physiological risk for things like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension across the board. So body weight, hip and waist circumference, hypertension, stage one and two risk shown on the bottom there, that again and again, what we see is that the sexual trauma group of greatest risk are presenting, remember these women are in their late 30s and early 40s, presenting maybe earlier, which might go into that allostatic risk and uh, telomere length, all of the data we know about um, trauma is that the women who experienced it prior to puberty, so younger exposure, led to the risk for all of these physiological uh, outcomes related to changes in hypertension risk and diabetes and, and obesity. But if you looked at neuropsychiatric risk, it was again, looking at fear potentiated startle, we see again the women who had experienced it related again, possibly to our outcomes in the 17Q gene cluster that the women who experienced it during adolescence show the increased changes in fear potentiated startle and potentially some changes related to skin conductance. That's something that we're currently looking at and how those outcomes might be related. So I just wanna highlight how important that is. And then how do we take this into a mouse, right? You can't ask those mechanistic questions in the humans because you can't manipulate the human being, of course, the way that we can the mouse. And so we have been able to take mice, female mice especially, and expose them to chronic 
sensory modalities of stress, trying to make this as relevant as possible. And of course, we cannot take sexual trauma and we cannot model that in a mouse in no way possible. But we can take sensory modalities of stress if that is in fact part of this programming. So sensory modalities of stress in the mice include things that tactile, olfaction, auditory, visual cues, things like that of the sensory nature and stress the animals repeatedly over these unique windows. So something uh, similar to the adolescent window for a mouse is about three to five weeks compared to adult. And we do see changes in their startle magnitude and their freezing in these animals. And interestingly, when we look at the extracellular vesicles from these animals, we can detect changes in some of the same and that same gene cluster in the mouse, which is 11QD cluster. And so following up on that is a way in which we can then identify specific mechanisms and then go back into the human being again and ask about, again, our most vulnerable populations. And I think that's super important of taking what we learn and ask, now, what about in pregnancy? Can we learn more about, because the placenta, I told you, secretes the most extracellular vesicles. So might that be really important for thinking about who is at risk and when, and how would we think about interventions? Right, and we're gonna need animal models if we're going to be testing out interventions. So that's gonna be important moving forward. All right, so I'm not gonna spend much of time here because we all know the increased rates of black women for morbidity and mortality. And that gives rise, I think, to the necessity for why we need to move forward and understanding mechanisms that pinpoint biomarkers of risk. This, I'm not gonna go into, this is just some of the, the details of the cell types in the placenta and maternal decidua that secrete those EVs sort of as the premise for why understanding risk, whether it's gestational diabetes in pregnancy or neuropsychiatric, things like risk for postpartum depression, I think are things that really could come out of this work. Uh, I'm not gonna go into ACEs because you guys are all familiar with those, but I think it is important to think about the community that you're working in and engaging with in this Be More for Healthy Moms study that was conducted here in the city of Baltimore, we all know that for the presentation of four or more ACEs prior to adulthood is your biggest risk for disease across the lifespan. And so you can see the difference there. Comparing currently pregnant women around the United States on the left, it's about 12.5%, give or take, who currently, who had more four or more ACEs prior to pregnancy. And in Baltimore, that number is over 60%. So you can't apply global numbers to all of the communities that we're studying. I think that's really important for how the lens we look through when we're writing grants or, or conducting our studies in, in, in a population. I don't have a ton of time left, but I, I do want to spend a few minutes on the flip side of thinking about, in terms of our vulnerable population, women and pregnancy, very important. I think another population we tend to forget about is dad. And, and the signals, again, that something that you probably don't hear a lot about in your studies, which is sperm. I know way too much about sperm for a neuroscientist, um, but if you're talking about access to a tissue, if you wanna really understand vulnerability, it is way more accessible than female oocytes by far, very much easier to get access to, very much easier to study. And if you're gonna do an omics approach, a lot easier to assess. We started thinking about this years and years ago and our mouse models as a way to understand those mechanisms and those signals that adversity across the lifespan, especially up until conception. So the preconception signals. Um, and it really took off after that, going from the mouse to the human and back to the mouse again, and, and as well as cell culture. I'm not gonna go into all of these studies, but I do wanna leave you with a little bit of this, of why dad is important as well. I think too often when we're studying anything from autism or schizophrenia or any neurodevelopmental risk, we often think to ask mom about what her experiences were, excuse me, or what's happened in her pregnancy, but very seldom does anybody ever ask dad. And so there's tons of information if you look back through the literature and epidemiological data from everything from the, the Holocaust to the Dutch hunger winter to the Swedish famines, all of this data has contributed to our information that there is something about the preconception environment that shapes the way that conception occurs, maybe enhances or makes it more complicated or, or less likely to happen or increases rates. And I wanna kind of stay at that level because I think we can go down too far in the weeds of 
really trying to say that there's epigenetic marks in these germ cells. And I just don't think the evidence is super strong in that regard in terms of what happens post-conception. And there's a ton of controversy in this field. And I don't really think that that's important. I think the signals that come together, regardless of what they are at conception can, can pose a huge impact on the rate at which post-conception cell steps, post-conceptional uh, cell steps occur. And those can be impactful for brain development without there needing to be this epigenetic um, uh, mark that's perpetuated. And that's really where the controversy is, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cover that. Okay, so just to understand some of the studies that we've done, we've done chronic stress again, because you can't traumatize a mouse, but you can stress a mouse. So this is males. So this is, you can do four weeks. Four weeks is the minimal. It's enough of a stress to alter the signals that we detect in the sperm. There's all kinds of things you can detect in sperm. Sperm, humans and mice, sperm, uh, are full of small non-coding RNA. Pi RNA, micro RNA, tRNA fragments, they're all there. Some of them are residual from spermatogenesis. Some of them are taken on or acquired in the reproductive process through the, the mouse reproductive tract and, and the human too as well. Okay, so we have this model. We've been working on this for over a decade. We see all kinds of changes in offspring. I'm not gonna go through any of that. But the message I do wanna leave you with is this idea. This is taking, you know, the course of spermatogenesis in the testes is a really protective mechanism. And maybe when you think about the brain, you don't spend as much time thinking about sperm uh, as I do. But the reason that the environment doesn't alter spermatogenesis is because it's really protected. And that makes sense evolutionarily because if the environment could influence when the DNA is most vulnerable during spermatogenesis, right? You would wipe out a species. So it makes sense that there's very little vulnerability to changes acquired by sperm during the testes maturation. However, at the end of spermatogenesis, at the completion of that process, sperm are, cannot, cannot fertilize, They're, they cannot swim, they're not mature. They are pushed into this tissue here called the epididymis. This is actually called the caput or head of the epididymis on the top here. This is actually a very specialized tissue. And you're seeing in cross section in the middle there, these are epididymal epithelial cells and they perform a really important function. They secrete all of the necessary factors. The sperm are actually in this really interesting low pH quiescent state, or is it high, it's a high pH, sorry, quiescent state. So they're just sitting basically immodal, mobilized in, in this state here um, where they are, waiting to capture all of the information being transmitted in these tubules during this really long period of time. It is in this tissue because now the DNA, dad's DNA is totally protected. It's all wound up in proteins. It cannot be influenced. Nothing can be changed about its methylation patterns or whatever you wanna talk about, right? That can't happen. There's no machinery present. But what they can do is they can acquire signals from the environment. And that includes, as, as drawn out here, um, the current thinking in this field is that extracellular vesicles, which are secreted in very high abundance into these tubules, can be acquired by these sperm. In fact, it is a requirement of their maturational state. So now you can imagine a way in which these teeny tiny nanoparticles whether they deliver their content, this is not known, or whether they just uh, form, um, form bonds in a way that they can stick to the sperm, that they can then be acquired and transmit that information to the egg at, fer at fertilization. So that's the message I wanna leave you with. And now you can imagine a way in which the environment now, through chronicity of experience and exposure, can shape these somatic cells, shaping the content of the germ cell to carry that to, and I don't have time to go into all these studies that this brilliant graduate student, Jennifer Chan, did in the lab, but she basically developed a stress in the dish model where she was able, in fact, to collect these EVs secreted by these epididymal epithelial cells, conduct a whole bunch of really complicated molecular mechanism studies, looking at omics approaches across the board, comparisons to sperm in vitro and vivo. This is like four years of her work right here in this figure. But all is to say that we could model this, we could develop a system whereby we could take those extracellular vesicles from the dish, expose them to sperm from a mouse, perform ICSI, put them on the right and left side of the uterus and ask questions about 
Does it matter? And the answer in this very complicated figure is, yes, it does. It actually produced really big differences in the rates of the brain's development and how on the very, very bottom there, those animals interacted or interfaced with stress in their environment. So that's just to leave you with that message that, yeah, there's ways in which there are absolutely mechanisms that those signals can be transmitted. So I'm gonna leave you with that and how we then move forward. This is a really complicated study we're doing. We're using fiber photometry on these offspring brain now to ask, well, how did it shape the brain? What did it change? Just because you shifted development or enhanced implantation, which is in fact what we see. So the brain's developing slightly faster. What does that mean? What does that mean for how the extracellular matrix forms, how those neurons development? That's something we can use fiber photometry to answer. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the fiber photometry studies. And in fact, we've then followed up on these studies at Penn when both Neil Epperson and I were there. She's a psychiatrist. We did all of the studies to ask in humans. This is beautiful data we did in recruiting Penn undergrads. And we were able to assess within and between male subjects over six months. We were able to ask questions about their sperm content. And lo and behold, stress does matter. So it was great. We were able to incorporate the stress of final exams in here and build a really complicated model about time of stress plus one, plus two, plus three in the turnover of their sperm. And would you believe if you just focus on these microRNA and this complicated model that rose to the top, three of the five microRNA that we identified in the study already known in the reproductive field to be important for reproductive processes. You know, it's not, I guess it's not terribly surprising we're looking at sperm, but yet it was a very complicated model. So I do think it's surprising and we've learned a lot about the dynamic state of male sperm. And I wanna point out, if you look at the bottom there, those graphs I'm showing you, that the dark blue is pi RNAs. And that data to us was really surprising because it seems to be that these pi RNAs are cyclic. No one's ever identified cyclicity in male germ cells before. So that's super interesting to follow up on. Anyway, I'm gonna leave you with that. I know it's a lot of information, but the exercise of vesicles, I think are gonna be the, the next decade of sort of a very complicated signal, but really a, in terms of stress response and biology, we can use them as biomarkers. We can make synthetic EVs. Maybe we can think about interventions in a way that we couldn't before and a timing specificity to what those EVs tell us. So. Thank you for your time and your patience. All of this work was done by amazing trainees in the lab. Jennifer Chan was a graduate student whose thesis work I whipped through uh, there about the mice. And she's now uh, a star postdoc at Ian Mays' lab at Mount Sinai. Uh, Nicole Canyu is an MD PhD who is following up on a lot of this really interesting stuff and finding amazing differences just in the mitochondria uh, of these epididymal epithelial cells that give rise to changes in sperm. And Chris Morgan did all the human work on that. And Katie Morrison has, is the one that did all the collaboration with the Grady Trauma Project. And she's now an assistant professor at West Virginia. Um, of course, all of our amazing collaborators across the board, we couldn't do this translational work without um, their interest in doing really, really important science at the human level that allows us to ask these questions. Of course, our NIH funding, um, and follow us on Twitter, because we do a lot of stuff engaging in the community around stress and trauma. Please do contact me if you're interested in the Trauma Summit in, in June, and I'm happy to extend you an invitation. And if anybody is a trainee um, at any point of transition, we are moving to Denver, the Anschutz Medical Campus. We're going to have all kinds of fun tools. Again, working with Neil Epperson, who's now the chair of psychiatry. Um, and all the development that, um, that we're going to be doing on both human and animal studies um, at, uh, in Denver, which is going to be exciting. So let me know. Any questions, Robin? I'm happy to answer anything. Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to, wait, I'm supposed to do this. Hold on. Here's your code. You win a prize or something. Is that what this is? Okay, I'll ask take, home, take home a car or something. <laughs> is there any prize? Prize? Robin, no, go question? for it, Kai. Uh, Check in. Hi, <laughs> my name is Kevin Burroughs. I'm a, a staff scientist here. Um, Leandra, Dr. Leandra Hall, and I have been doing EV research for several years, uh, specifically focusing on the neuronal and astrocyte. 
he dry uh, enriched axons. I mean, EV is <laughs> we call EV now. When we started, it's still called exosomes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody called them exosomes initially. Yeah, it's hard yeah, to it's, it's on to the change case. that language. Yeah. So thank you for the fantastic talk. It's really inspiring and it it is really great. Uh, so my question is about uh, the particle size. So as you mentioned, the size is really important. Um, so how do you make sure the size you measure they are like true size? Uh, so from your presentation, the slides you showed earlier, I think you show the, the average particle size, the EV particle size, they're like a 120 nanometers around. By your uh, nature communication paper. Yeah, I just put out your paper this morning. <laughs> uh, so the average um, particle size is around 150 to 175 uh, nanometers. So I noticed you use the nano nano size uh, uh -huh. to measure the particle size, right? Yep. Uh, from what we experienced is that the nano size tends to measure uh, like a larger. Uh, the particle size like a raised larger in nano size compared to uh, a particle size analyzer from a spectri spectri DNA. Uh, so we we use both uh, equipment to measure the size and that's what we experienced. Also, I noticed that uh, there's a paper from molecular psychiatry by uh, Saeed et al. from last year, and their particle size, like uh, the total EV, just the EV now. They also did the neuron enriched EV. So their size is around 130, but their neuron enriched EV is the size a little bit small. So I'm wondering if we use like a different equipment. Well, oh, I see. So, the, so I think a bigger a bigger question here than the the readout the equipment that's reading your EV, which of course we used to send our stuff down to UNC Chapel Hill, and then we identified a, a nanoset on campus, and then we bought a Zeta view for ourselves. And so, sure, equipment's going to have a slight bias. And yeah. readout. I think a bigger impact is the method utilized for isolation from. Mm. Right, because if you are grinding up tissue, you're not getting secreted EVs. You're getting all kinds of things that are in the right. cell, right? right? And so, from plasma, you're getting secreted EVs that are in circulation. So right there, there's going to be a, a difference, right? You can call it a bias or whatever you want to call it. Grinding up tissue is never a great way to isolate EVs because you you can't say whether or not those were meant to be secreted or they're acting intracellularly, right? Right. But I will also say. Um, in the 15 years of working in this field, we've the field has dramatically changed the, the, the method or protocol of how you say you have EVs, right? There's a million validation steps that we go through in addition to the nanosite. That's just one thing we do, right? So there's all kinds of garbage that can also change the size average that, right? So yeah. without doing EM, I mean, there's lots of ways to do this. I do think you're going to get slight variations depending on the machine, but I think a bigger impact is the method of isolation. Are you doing ultra centrifugation? Are you yeah. doing like exoquick, exoquick, which is mostly garbage? Are you doing are you doing a small um, chroma, chromatography exclusion? Right. There's lots of ways to get a much more pure population. With a more pure population, you're cleaving off garbage. You're going to start really limiting your size that you're focusing on. So it just depends on your question and how clear you want to be that you're talking about EVs mm -hmm. and not other similar size proteins. I see. Okay, that's and from, ti Thank from you. tissue. Tissue is the hardest yeah. because you're grinding up everything and releasing all kinds of stuff, and and that's the hardest to do. But the exoquick is probably the the least clean way to do this. Yeah, for the total exoquick, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm Leandra Figueroa Hall. I'm a postdoc research associate here working with Kai. Um, so I noticed in a few of your EV depictions, you have ICAM-1 being expressed on the plasma membrane. Do you know if this um, protein is at all involved in like the formation or function of EVs? So you're talking about the, the pictures that I stole off the right. internet of a picture of an EV. <laughs> I have I we we don't study ICAM one. I'm guessing, you know, depending on how old that picture is, somebody surely probably from the cancer field has studied it exhaustively. I don't study it. I have no idea. We focus a lot 
on tool development and we use the Tetra Spanins. So we've made uh, an HA tagged CD63 Tetra Spanin conditional clone because there's currently no way to follow these things around. And that's a real limitation of the field. Um, how do you know it's coming from the placenta and going to the you know, liver? I don't know. So um, we've spent a lot of time doing tool development and validation. There aren't a lot of tools and that's one of the things. So we've studied a lot about the, the presence of the different tetraspanins, but ICAM one, I don't, I don't know that much about it. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Dracy, a question I had was, um, so the the findings you had back with kind of the adolescent um, trauma um, in terms of the reduction in size and then the kind of less stable, um, less stability, like if you measure those things um, from EVs in the same adult over time, how stable are those measured? Like if, if they, their stability measure of their vesicles, does yeah, that change yeah. over time, like depending no, on their stress that's level? A, I mean, that's a great question and it's not really something well understood. If you take a, a general population of cells across, you know, uh, uh, just a general human population, you're going to get average, again, based on the question that um, Taiping was just asking me, um, depending on the, the, the method of your isolation and how you're looking at using the, the nanoparticle tracker. Um, repeatedly within, for instance, our animal models in circulation in a, an adult animal, they're pretty stable. And so if you see that difference, you can pretty much reliably say that something something's happening. How do you then go to the next step? Which is always my question when I present this data, because I you know see it all the time, which is like, okay, but then now what? So we know that this, the size is smaller. We know that the zeta potential has changed, but which population? And it becomes, a, without great tools, it becomes a harder question to get at. And so then you have to kind of return to your cell culture methods where you can ask in a very dynamic way. We're doing things like high and low glucose. If you want to look at something related to diabetes, we can do glucocorticoids if we want to understand stress. Those are all the things that we do in culture. And you can then do repeated assaying and you can look at the difference in the, uh, the cellular function at the same time you're looking at the secretion into the, the medium. So stability within a pure population, really reliable readout. In a general population, reliable, but, you know, there's going to be some, you know, depending on, right, circadian rhythm is going to matter. So if you take all of your samples in the morning and the next time you do it, you take them in the evening, that's going to matter. There seems to be differences between males and females. So if your population is slightly mixed, that's going to matter. So there are factors for sure that matter. It's not just random, but, you know, trying to control for them all. Has there been any experimental work like to do, say, current interventions for PTSD or for whatever, um, and whether there's changes in some of these? Those measures? are things that we're currently trying to work on in various collaborations of, of if you identify treatment resistant depression and then go through antidepressant treatment or ketamine, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had a lot of, of collaborative interest around those kinds of questions because they're already doing blood sampling anyway. The problem typically tends to be not enough of an N. You aren't gonna be able to do this in 10 subjects. Although I will say, I'm gonna point out that we did the, the omics, unbiased omics uh, in the Grady trauma study. And that was you know 22 to 25 per group. I never, my wildest dreams would have predicted we would anything would have fallen out of that. That was very surprising. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that we just got really, really lucky in that study. I would, I would not have predicted that in a human population. Um, so it's, it's again, are you powered to ask an omics question? Um, but I do think that EVs, in order to be evolutionarily relevant, have to have a very rapid turnover. If they're just kind of hanging around, then there's really no point in having them, right? Other, other signaling systems can compensate for the same thing they're doing. So it must be that it's an average pool and that change in size, zeta potential, protein content matters in, in a, some kind of a dynamic way. And so getting at that is gonna be a, a really great question, but it's gonna require a lot of resources because you're gonna have to have repeated timing within and between individual asking about very specific questions, I think. Very cool.
Other questions? And I know we're, we, I think a lot of people have um, meetings with you um, next. I think um, it's actually myself and, and Evan uh, with you next. So we'll switch over to the other Zoom call. Um, so hopefully I think people will um, have questions and discussions during those meetings. But okay, fabulous. If any, again, if anybody's interested either in the summit, please reach out. I'm happy to extend an invitation or, or any questions about, you know, Denver, Do you like huh. skiing or hiking or perhaps <laughs> place to continue your training. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I think it is a different Zoom call, right? That yep. is for, okay. Yep. I'll see you in there in a second. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna run to the, the ladies' room, but I'll be right back. Thank you.